Um, so Pope Francis Third encyclical given in Assisi at the tomb of St. Francis on 3rd October, vigil of the feast of a saint in the year 2020, is as Stefano was already telling us, conceived as a complement to his second encyclical, Laudato Si, which too referred to St. Francis already in its title. While the earlier text had its focus on the relation of- Mario, he speaks slowly, please. In okay. Country, I not understand nothing. While the earlier text had its focus on the relation of humans to nature, the center of the later encyclical is from the beginning the relation between humans. Uh, thus it is connected to a longer history of theology as well as of ecclesiastic magisterium for the ecological problem began to be understood as a crucial scientific, political, philosophical and theological problem only in the course of the 20th century. I would like to focus on three issues that I found particularly striking from a philosophical point of view. First, I will analyze how the sources used by the Holy Father express the basic content of encyclical. Second, I want to reflect on the theory of moral knowledge, partly exposed, partly implied by the text. Third, I want to discuss the duality of personal and institutional fraternity recognized by Pope Francis. Let me begin with a delineation of a very clear structure of encyclical. Uh, in the first chapter, Dark Clouds Over a Closed World, Pope Francis engages in a critical descriptive account of the world's contemporary state. Despite all its opportunities, globalization can lead to a general superficiality and indifference, which can easily be strengthened by the modern media. This explains we need to go back to the core of the Christian message exposed in the second chapter, A Stranger on the Road. This message can help us in envisaging and engendering an open world opposed to the closed world mentioned at the beginning and in shaping a heart open to the whole world. This conversion of the heart must not be limited to the individual. It must manifest itself in a better kind of politics as well as in dialogue and friendship in society and paths of renewed encounter. The eighth and final chapter, Religions at the Service of Fraternity in Our World, exposes the theology of a various religion. One of the most striking formal features of the encyclical is certainly the frequent quotation from the document signed by both Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar Ahmad Al-Tayyeb, most extensively in the antepenultimate paragraph. For the Sunnite Imam inspired his thought in a way similar to the impact that the Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew had on the composition of the earlier encyclical, as he tells us at the beginning. Not being a theologian myself, I can only hazard the guess that this is the first time in the history of papal encyclicals that a text co-authored by a Muslim plays such an important role beside the traditional quotations from the Bible, the church fathers, the scholastics, particularly Aquinas, and ecclesiastical documents by Episcopal synods, earlier pontiffs, and by the author himself. But not only a Muslim authority is quoted with approval. Concerning the command Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself, we read that it, quote, was usually understood as referring to one's fellow citizens. Yet the boundaries gradually expanded, especially in the Judaism that developed outside of the land of Israel. We encounter the command not to do to others what you would not want them to do to you, um, to be um, uh, to be, uh, for 15. In the first century before Christ, Rabbi Hillel stated, this is the entire Torah. Everything else is commentary. The passage is fascinating for two reasons. First, it recognizes, recognizes a gradual evolution in the moral doctrines of the Bible. But such an evolution occurred is evident to everyone who can think historically and is trained hermeneutically. But whoever remembers that the oath against modernism was required of all clergy and professors in philosophical theological seminaries until 1957 um, cannot help being surprised by the speed with which reasonable doctrines once condemned are now acknowledged in the most authoritative church documents. Second, the passage suggests that already before Christ, Judaism had begun to develop more universalistic ethical ideas than in the oldest texts of the Bible. But Jesus goes beyond Rabbi Hillel because he turns the golden rule from its negative form 
to its positive one. In the New Testament, Hillel's precept was expressed in positive terms in everything do to others as you would have them to do to you, for this is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, 12. Even if it has a Christian origin, the validity and the range of this command are not limited to Christians. Based on this command, Pope Francis reiterates the recent condemnation of the death penalty by the magisterium and while not denying the right to defend oneself and to fight against injustice, warns against an overly broad interpretation of, the, um, of his potential right in the recourse to war. These reflections are found in the context of a splendid interpretation of a parable of the Good Samaritan, the main focus of the second chapter of the encyclical. Why is this interpretation so profound? On the one, it is fed by knowledge of a historical context. On the other hand, it is not an erudite reflection on a text of the past, but applies it to our own situation and shows that we all share traits of the various characters of a story. The robbers, the people who pass by without helping, the secret allies of the robbers, as Pope Francis calls them, the victim, and ideally the Samaritan too, if we make the right choices. It is this combination of historical contextualization and application to the present that leads to a central point of interpretation. For we must know that the Jew looked down on the Samaritan and considered them impure. By depicting a member of this despised religious community as true neighbor, unlike the priest and the Levite, Jesus shows us that the mere belonging to a religious community <clears throat> is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for fulfilling God's central command. And clearly, Pope Francis teaches that this applies also to membership in the Catholic Church. Living love is more important than preaching it, as St. Francis showed in his visit to Sultan Malik al Kamil. Francis did not wage a war of words aimed at imposing doctrines. He simply spread the love of God. Despite all the dogmatic differences, the world religions can and should agree on condemning violence, opting for a meaningful interreligious dialogue, and recognizing the values, rights, and duties flowing from human dignity. Pope Francis, who in the great tradition of Christian humanism did not hesitate to quote pagan authors like Virgil and Cicero in his text, at the end declares his intellectual debt to non-Catholic Christians such as Martin Luther King and Desmond Tutu, but also to the Hindu Mahatma Gandhi. Yet he ends before the two final prayers, the first of which can be shared by all believers in God, the second by all Christians, with quotes from blessed Charles de Foucault. His commitment to the Christian identity and to the doctrine of the Trinity as a metaphysical foundation of the imperative of love is not diminished by the respect for other religious traditions. In this respect, he does not only reach or demand, he expresses and lives it in the way in which he uses sources from other traditions and integrates them into the rich magisterium of the Catholic Church. I have only a few minutes left, so I will rush over the central idea of the second and the third part. It is very important that Pope Francis' tireless engagement in religious dialogue must not be constructed as suggesting that theological truths are a function of what happens in such dialogues. On the contrary, he insists most forcefully on the necessity of an ontological basis for consensus and thus rejects the consensus theory of truth. Uh, while Pope Francis recognizes pluralism as an undeniable fact of a contemporary condition, he rightly warns against relativism with the excellent argument that ultimately it corrodes the belief in any objective value order, and thus also in the duty to love. If there is no ideal value order, values are merely a matter of social forces, and therefore they will be at the mercy of raw, or which is perhaps even worse, hidden and manipulative power. The solution is not relativism. Murder is not wrong simply because it is socially unacceptable and punished by law. Pope Francis rightly underlines that this metaphysics of morals, if I may use this term not to be found in the encyclical, must be accompanied by a corresponding epistemology. It is not sufficient that there are moral values. Our mind must be conceived as being able to relate to them and grasp them as the truth par excellence. And this means it must be able to go beyond the sensual inclinations that characterize our animal nature. As he says, if we give this up as a result of a displacement of moral reasoning, the law is no longer seen as reflecting a fundamental notion of justice, but as mirroring notions currently in vogue. Break down and soothe everything is leveled down by a superficial 
battered consensus. Pope Francis' central aim is to find a balance between a justification of a current practice of dialogue and the traditional metaphysics of values. Such balance is only possible if the practice of the dialogue is itself inspired by the recognition of certain metaphysical principles. A dialogue that really searches for truth must fulfill certain criteria. The concepts must be used, must be clear and distinct. The arguments must be valid and ideally they must be even sound. That is a must start for the two premises. Since the premise is often controversial, it is important that various positions are seriously debated and investigated in relation to the consequences. And since the specialization in the various disciplines is based on a deliberate abstraction from other aspects of reality that continue to exist, the various disciplines must be united in a common search. The hitting upon ultimate truths is not something to be regretted for the dialogue's sake, for it is the starting point of further dialogues that try to apply the general principles to various practical rules. I two think uh, two minutes, uh, only very shortly about the difficult balance between the um, fraternity as an ethical concept and fraternity as an institutional concept. Since fraternity entails a at least a perception of the individuality of a person that I consider my next my, uh, uh, neighbor, there is simply no way how one can practice real fraternity with regard to several billion people. Our lifespan is too short to come to know seriously more than several thousand people. The only way how a truly fraternal society can be erected is by harnessing one of the greatest social inventions, the division of labor. Only by ascribing concrete responsibilities to specific individuals can we achieve the desired social successes. Uh, all this is not denied by Pope Francis, who clearly connects a moral idea of charity to social and political institutions, writing that even the Good Samaritan needed an inn, and recognizing that building bridges is as important as helping an elderly person cro cross a river. But I think that he's right that our trust in these institutions can become a cheap way to evade responsibilities. First, such institutions have to be measured by their success, and their success is not guaranteed. Circumstances may change and demand new ideas. Second, human nature is such that it may even hijack such institutions and deliberately lead them to ends that are different from those for which we are created. And third, Pope Francis insists on the fact that a personal encounter with the individual in need cannot be replaced by even the smartest economic policies as much as they are needed to help people to find their employment. We need individual virtues, particularly the capacity of sacrificing oneself. Thank you. Okay, let me finish here. Thank you very much, Vittorio. I know that uh, time is uh, so constraining. Now